everyone. Welcome to the Brain Can channel. This episode will be about uh, neurotechnologies and brain implants. And I'm happy to introduce you the ex expert in all these uh, spheres, Professor Dr. Uli Hoffman. Professor Hoffman, Uli, I'm so happy that you could uh, find time for my project. And um, I know that you have uh, started your career in, um, in biophysics. So please, uh, could you tell us a bit uh, how you come from physics to neuroscience and uh, why you have done so? <laughs> Well, actually, I didn't start my career in, in physics or in biophysics. I started my career at school. Okay. Where, uh, but because, well, you know, I'm, I'm of that age where I saw the original Star Wars episodes at the time when they were still not denumerated by one, two, and three. Right? Mm -hmm. So that, that's how old I am. And that's actually 1984. And, and number two was 1984, roughly. And, and I was impressed at this time, deeply impressed. Um, about this, the scene where Luke Skywalker, the hero, who, for those of you who don't know Star Wars, it's a pity for you, but for me, Luke Skywalker, who lost his hand in a battle with his, with his dad, and, um, and he needed a replacement hand, right? Because, of course, he needed to play another, uh, another episode, at least. And, and this replacement hand was so cool for me to see. It was a, you know, yeah, there was a robot, med medical robot, and this medical robot was kind of playing around with the tendons inside the hand, blah, 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 blah. And the fingers were twitching, and then he was poking into the hand, and the fingers were twitching, and that was so cool. And I thought, ah, hmm, that might be useful for somebody who lost his hand. And uh, how to do that? And that was at school. And I decided I want to be a part of that thing. And so either I am going to study medicine or I do something real cool, which is I decided to start studying physics, uh, applied physics after that, after my school time. But in order to get a little experience in medical stuff and medical terminology, I went to the army and actually I became a paramedic. So my, my medical expertise starts before I did study anything. And, and then with physics, um, I tried to come with physics as close as possible to this goal, to this grand idea of having a mind-controlled, intuitive robotic device. And, um, and that's actually when I, uh, I studied physics, I got my PhD in a more, more or less related field. And then I went to Caltech for two years and uh, and I came a lot closer when it came to implants and silicon probes at that time. And I brought that knowledge from Caltech back home to Germany, to Europe, got the first European grant on uh, silicon, silicone, uh, silicon, silicon implants, kind of the rigid implant mm -hmm. side recording systems. And from then on, everything else developed. Next one was steel electrodes multi-site steel electrodes. Next one was multi-site polyimide electrodes, flexible ones, soft ones. And, and that's where all that kind of came to happen. And that was a very, a very quick run through. So feel free to ask whatever you want. So, but uh, uh, am I correct uh, that uh, this uh, field is quite uh, old already so so i mean uh, brain implants uh, you you say that this uh, story with silicon materials uh, have started about uh, 30 years ago it's even older actually the first idea about a silicon multi-electrode implant was published 1972 by uh, by Ken Weiss, so that's a that's a paper where he kind of was projecting the methods developed very recently in uh, semiconductor industry, and he transferred those ideas then to this implant technology, literally. So seventy two was the I think was the original publication of that paper, and from then things took very on took, took on uh, very slowly actually seventy two this first paper, and in the eighties um, the people of the so called Michigan group. Um, they were. They came. They used the lithography methods and had those finger type. We call them uh, like prong, like a like a, a like a time mm -hmm. uh, type electrode which you plug into and which has the electrodes on the side of its of its little fingers here. Um, they developed this on a flat lithographic basis, whereas the people in uh, in Utah 
uh, Dick Norman and his group, uh, they ca- they used uh, the silicon devices and the silicon and the dice saw, so literally a saw, in order to cut from a solid piece of silicon several electrodes, and we call it bed of nails implants, which is then mm-hmm. literally just the, 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 the structure of bed of nails. But you plug that mm-hmm. into the brain and you get then recordings from the very tip of those nails. So these two opposing methods were developed roughly in the 80s. And then the 90s is picked up a little more because people found it useful to get recordings from neurons, from many neurons. Mm-hmm. Until then, one neuron was sufficient to have a career. Um, by then, it turns out that you want to have more recordings, more and more by roughly 1999 or so. Um, uh, Miguel Nicoleles and um, see, my memory is, is failing me. Um, but anyway, Miguel Nicoleles came up with an idea that let's put uh, silicon arrays into rats and see what we can make out of all those recordings. And they learned to use, the, it's called the so-called neuro- neuronal population code. So the more neurons you can record from, the easier it is to deduce something from it. If you only use one neuron, you have to record a long time, but you cannot use that to run anything in real time. But uh, if you record from, Miguel showed that when you record from at least 30 neurons at the same time, you can run a simple uh, switch, a simple system, which can be driven by the thoughts, by the neuron activity only. So that's roughly the the time. And, and, And unfortunately... In the 1990, in 1999, 2000, so the silicon arrays were kind of relatively popular, and they were put by 2004 the first time into humans. Um, I mean, you can imagine it's kind of a tough one because silicon is fragile, right? So put that in a human is a hmm, trade-off. What might happen? So there were people who were willing to to risk that, which were terminally ill or which did not have any other chance, anyways. And so by roughly 2003, four. You had the first monkey and you had the first humans implanted with the silicon bed of nails arrays. And they and since then they were they are using this type of array. It's called the, the BlackRock array nowadays. It used to be the Utah array. And this BlackRock array now is in a in a relatively long period of time used for for unfortunately not so many patients, but a lot strong in neuroscience and non-human primates monkey research. Um, so it's kind of an upstreaming, it's an upstream process, but it's very slow. Uh, altogether, the, there was something right now, I think the state of, I'm, I'm not sure about the current state, but something in the range of 30 patients have been implanted with a silicone bed of nail array ever. Mm-hmm. Um, I have a question. Sure. Uh, if, we, if we talk about uh, humans, uh, how many electrodes do we need uh, to have these uh, sufficient, more or less accurate uh, recordings? That is a difficult question because you have to look, you have to see that over time. So you can you can get nice recordings, you can get nice output for controlling something, at least in animals, already with 100 electrodes and 100 neurons, okay? Not every electrode you plug in reaches one neuron. So if you plug in a 10 by 10 array, you might be theoretically get something like 200, 300 neurons. Practically, you will not get more than say 60, 50, 60. It really depends. And unfortunately, it will change over time, which is even worse because the brain will react on the implant. And this reaction will cause neurons to lose contact to the recording site so you do not get the original action potential Mm -hmm. of the neurons anymore. So the question, how many do we need to implant is really difficult to say. My feeling is that you want to start with something like 600, perhaps a thousand electrodes, Mm -hmm. which give you something like 500 neurons, which will stay then for a longer period of time, something like a couple of hundred, and then may even change over time but that's wild guesses. But that's the order of magnitude I'm I'm thinking when it comes to how many do we need. Okay, I see. So, but if, uh, for example, we have uh, patients with different pathologies, um, will it determine the number of electrodes? Because I guess uh, since uh, patients um, may possess different pathologies or, and different brain regions that are impaired, probably it will define uh, how big uh, our chips uh, should be. 
and um, how often should we replace chips? Okay, so this is a really, really, it's an excellent question. And the question is very difficult to answer, and I think it's, a, but it's actually a crucial question because whatever you do when it comes to patient and clinical use, you want to know for what purpose you do that. So there is clearly in this context no one size fits all. So if you want to, what, what do you want to treat? This is the first question you have to ask if you come up with anything for patients. What do you want to treat? And, uh, and by the way, this is to me, to me completely unclear when it comes to, to the uh, Neuralink system. What the hell do you want to treat? One has to, one has to keep in mind that with the current systems, when it comes to single electrodes, to, to single neural recordings, to small stuff, you are only reaching the first top layers of the cortex. So you are not, none of those things goes deeper than a couple of millimeters, make it three, mm -hmm. two, three millimeters. So it stays in the top layers of the cortex. None of them goes deeper. Not the silicon probes of Utah, not the flexible probes of, uh, of Neuralink, not the probes of Paradromics, Matt Engie. They all have, they have wires. They all are content with the surface of the brain. Now, what pathology can you treat there? That is the question. Yes, because in uh, neurodegenerative diseases and in uh, many pathologists with uh, paralysis or with trauma, uh, generally uh, the impaired regions uh, are located much deeper. So yeah. this, this is my question. Yes, what you can treat if you can place chip only on the top of, uh, of the cortex? What you can imagine is that you can implant into the motor cortex area and use that signal to control something, whether it's a robotic hand like in Star Wars in the end, or whether it's uh, a direct hookup to your computer system just to run the screen and to type, essentially. It's a different story. Motor cortex, you record from. When you want to replace lost senses, like touch, sense of touch, you can go in the somatosensory area and implant there and stimulate them there, which needs a different type of electrode than what you use for recording. Mm -hmm. If you want to treat blindness, you need a different type of electrode uh, because the stimulation you want to apply, kind of the current you want to apply, needs bigger areas. You cannot use the small mm -hmm. areas which are usually used for recording. From, from single neurons. You need a bigger area in order to reduce something which is it's called the charge density, how much current goes through the area of your electrode. If that is exceeding a certain limit, you're frying the, the neurons which are away from this new electrode, right? So it really depends on what you want to, to achieve in order to decide what is the best strategy to achieve that, what is the best material, what is the best implant stuff. It's really difficult. I, the answer to, to your original question is really, what do you want to achieve and where is it? Mm -hmm. Current neurodegenerative diseases like Parkinson's or, um, or tremor, essential tremor, or there's others like um, major depression disorder, or there is obsessive compulsive disorder. They do get brain implants deep in the brain with from my point of view, big electrodes, relatively big electrodes. Um, we talk a lot of magnitude. I talk about micrometer, they talk about millimeter electrodes. So, okay. so that okay. is kind of the difference. Um, but they need that because again, charge density needs to be needs to be low in order not to destroy tissue down there. And they need to go very deep. So there needs to be a certain mechanical stability to it. Again, it's a different approach, it's a different story. Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you for this wrap up about uh, general principles. Uh, I have a question about materials. So you said that uh, the initial material uh, was uh, silicon, but it's quite rigid. Uh, talking about uh, modern technologies, which materials are usually applied, especially if we want to go deeper in the brain? Yeah, so that is... <clears throat> If you go deeper in the brain, it's usually thin wires which are coiled up mm -hmm. into helicals. So they per se are very flexible. And they are wrapped up, they are covered by a silicone, by a silicone rubber sheet. Mm -hmm. okay? If you have them in your hands, I mean they feel they feel like a cable. They feel very, very soft. I find I need to find a cable here. They need to feel they feel very soft, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. even even more like this actually. Um 
they are okay and 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 they you can still put them in however when you look at the softness of the brain mm -hmm. you find out that even those silicone cables are a couple of orders of magnitude bigger and more rigid than the brain itself because so when you when you when you talk with people how do I like neurosurgeons or we with our animals you ask a neurosurgeon, how do you describe the brain? How does it feel to have a brain in your hand, which they usually don't do, yes. right? With your fingers, for example. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So how how do you how do you how does it feel? The answer you usually get is it feels like a very soft tapiota pudding. Okay, literally like cream caramel pudding, whatever. It's more or less the same consistency as a um, ocello in the United States. It would be jello, uh, very very shaky, very soft stuff. That's how they describe brain tissue. Now, if you go into this such a structure with something which is more rigid, even a silicone cable, mm -hmm. yes. even this cable, you put that into jello, the jello will still float around it and it will be cut off. There will be destruction just because whatever you put in there is less flexible as the brain itself. And this is a good point to ask you about allographic reactions. So this is uh, the reactions that uh, body... Uh, provides uh, to reject some uh, uh, materials, some new materials. And this is uh, very common for uh, any kinds of uh, implants, uh, but the strongest uh, reactions are described actually for brain implants because brain has a very strong immune system that uh, possesses all these re rejecting mechanisms. So uh, could you please uh, comment uh, do modern implants uh, wrestle this problem or this is just a question of time and people have to replace uh, old uh, implants with new or people, for example, uh, I don't know, patients have to take some uh, drugs that cease their immune reactions, how people behave uh, in this situation. So that is a... That is a literally and clearly ongoing research, which we are actually doing ourselves here. Um, so the brain is, if you, if, if you look, if you know from school still, right, then people, if they think about the brain and they tell you about the brain, they tell you neurons. Cool. They do the calculation, nice, wonderful. But they are, they are racehorses. They need people to help them, to pamper them. And those racehorses' neurons are encapsulated, are surrounded by astrocytes which are trying to maintain the environment as much as they can. And then there is a police team, which is called the microglia cells, which are running around. They, they are very peaceful if they're not disturbed. I and adore they, them. <laughs> yes, they're cool. They're nice pictures. And uh, yeah. I suppose they're cool, right? They're li these little stars. And, so <laughs> have different, and then you have other ones, oligodendrocytes and a couple of others. The interesting thing is you have at least as many neurons as, as you have astrocytes and as you have new microglia. They are completely under undervalued at this time, but they are the ones which are responsing, which are responsible for the answer to an implant. Now let's do let's implant something very soft into the brain. Let's take the softest thing you can imagine, which would be something like a like a like a like a rubber film. Okay. Okay, mm -hmm. this is a film. You put that thing in, whatever that means, but you put it in. And then it swims with the brain, and you hope that by swimming with the brain, it won't cause the foreign body reaction. But that's completely wrong. Whatever you put in there, as, as soon as you call, cause a trauma, meaning that you, are, you plug something in, the microglia get activated, activate the astrocytes, and they all together try to get rid of that intruder. Plus, you're opening blood vessels, because there are plenty of blood vessels in the brain as well. You're opening blood vessels, and then all of a sudden you get, in addition to what is already there, you get leukocytes and, and different other cells. Macrophages, T cells, yes. All, all these the immune cells. They, they all come in through the open blood, uh, blood brain barrier. And they try to re they re try to respond on the intruder too, but by doing that, they are even more activating the other cells in the brain, except the neurons. Mm -hmm. So what you have here, as soon as you open up the, the skull, literally, as soon as you open up the skull, we had that with rats. You open up the skull, you implant something, or you don't implant something, you get a response which is highly inflammatory. It's called a neuroinflammatory response, and. 
what we found out with our implants, and we try to have the softest possible, so it's 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 a polyimid, it's pl it's plastic, it's a very thin plastic film essentially. It swims with the brain, at least supposedly. Even with these polyimid films, we never go back to a healthy, stable state in the brain. We always are away from what is called homeostatic. Um, situation, we have always something like a little inflammation going on. It does not go away even after half a year of implantation in a rat. And the lifetime of a rat is something like two years, so it does not even go away after a quarter of a lifetime. And that is something which is, at this time, completely underrated from the complete community. And that is something which we, we're going to go on a conference next week and present that stuff. We will get a lot of punishment for it, clearly. But uh, that's why we do that. And, and yes. And we and uh, and, and we are, we are using a, a lot of new methods, which is not so so popular, which are not so popular in the field. But what we learned is that literally, as soon as you plug something in the brain and you're opening just the brain to the environment briefly, it's a trauma. And whether this trauma goes away or not is an open question. And for me, my fear is, and that's something which, when it comes to popular methods of implanting, <coughs> this might literally cause on the long term really big problems by for example causing brain tumors mm -hmm. so there is a there are cases out there and if you look carefully you find more and more of them there's one paper which i really like because they describe one case study it's only one case but they come up with a lot more statistics to that one case where somebody used a staple gun and shot himself a nail in, in his skull so the guy went into the hospital like he got CT and everything to find out where does it sit. We do we have to do surgery, and as it turns out, they didn't have to do surgery on him because the nail fell out at one time and it didn't do any further damage except that he had a scar on the, on his skin and everything mm -hmm. was cool. Except twenty years later, and I'm talking twenty years lifetime. It's it's really he was twenty at the time when he got the nail. Twenty years later, with age forty, he he went into the hospital. And because he developed an epileptic seizure or he developed seizures, they found out that at the spot, at the very spot where the nail went into the brain, he developed a glioblastoma, a brain tumor, based on the implant. Now, the fun part is that if we look at the genes, which no, no, not many people do, something like five groups do it right now in the world, if you look at the genes which are turned on mm -hmm. with an implant, you see that you are activating from the very first day, you're activating so-called oncogenes, which is precursor genes, which may or may not lead to, to tumor. And this is the stuff which we right now are a little concerned about, thinking of widespread implants for people with young age, for whatever ever purpose, may lead to those people to brain tumors down the road of their age. If you get a brain implant for Parkinson's disease at age, age 70, it doesn't matter because, hey, age 90, it's very hard for you to reach having that disease. But if you get this implant age 20 because you have a major depression disorder, mm -hmm. then you have a good chance that, or not a good chance, but you have a chance at least. There is a, a chance, yes. That... Where, where you might expect in age 40 that you have a brain tumor or not, or you might get one. That's something which we need to be kept in mind. If people are discussing, yeah, brain implant is cool. Let's have one. We need that for this or we need that for that. Let's yes. boost our abilities, yes. But still, if you have a foreign body, this uh, body works as a permanent trigger for your immune system. Exactly. So that's, that is the stuff which concerns me right now. And, and we are playing a little uh, the Cassandra of the ancient history. And uh, we are yelling in, into the void and saying that, hey, be careful, watch out. It might be dangerous. Yes, but we, I think we are the only ones in the world who are doing that. <laughs> <laughs> but this is science. This is why we all do this. Yes. Yeah, this is this is science, and this is um, we get attention once in a while. We'll see what happens. As I said, we have next week a conference in the in the U.S. Baltimore. It's about neuroengineering, <laughs> and um, we do have a, a seminar on this or a, a workshop on on this particular topic. And we'll see how many people are interested in that and will then attend and will keep that in mind. It is not, it, it's like everything. There is no free lunch, right? So you implant something in the body, in the brain, you have to expect consequences. The question is, are those consequences bearable or not? Yes. That is just the answer. 
and and depending on the disease, I mean, if I would get Parkinson my age right now, I would get an implant because I'm not making it to 80 anyways with all the other diseases I have. So I wouldn't mind, right? But if if I if somebody asks me, your son needs an implant, he is age 25, he needs an implant in order to treat that disease, I would really think of, is that a very severe disease? Is that something which is critical right now? Or is that something which is would be just nice to have? And nice to have, I would just not go. I agree with you, but there is one moment if we speak about uh, immune uh, reactivity, uh, reactivity of immune cells in the brain, there is one point uh, I would like to mention that with aging, this reactivity grows, actually. Yep. And even if we talk about implanting something necessary uh, into the brain of uh, uh, people uh, at the age over I don't know, 60, for example, 70, uh, still there is a high risk of these abnormalities in uh, brain immune system. And uh, thank you a lot that you pay attention on this because this is crucial and this is what people only are getting to understand. More often people actually afraid of uh, um, ethical moments uh, about uh, chips. Uh, I remember a presentation of Elon Musk uh, several years ago uh, when he suggested that uh, by using uh, neural link implants, people can just call Tesla uh, without any uh, physical contacts. Uh, but my question was, can uh, Tesla call you in return? And also other devices or other people who can control your chips, uh, can they manipulate you in order to get money, for example? Is it possible? No. <laughs> nice. <laughs> you see, that's, that's what, I, what, I started to, what I started to explain. Whether you're recording that information out of the brain or whether you would want to put information into the brain, it does not, even other people claim that, but it does not work well over the same channel. Okay? Mm -hmm. So you have to keep channels separate. So a stimulation areas, stimulation electrodes need to be bigger than recording electrodes mm -hmm. because of the electrical activity you are causing, you are injecting actually, right? You're injecting energy. So have them both together, it's really, really tough and I don't see that happening. But what I'm, what I'm more, what I'm, uh, and, and that's why I'm completely not concerned about getting something in my brain in detail, is that there is nobody in the world right now, and not even the, the, the brightest brains, minds right now, have any idea of how to do a proper physiological write back into the brain. There is some there is some writing back, sure. That's what they do in the brain stimulation. That's what you do with other stuff. But it's a very crude method. It's like you would hit somebody with a hammer. Yes, it's a way of communication, right? Mm -hmm, but yes. it's <laughs> not really a good one. So it's not really a sophisticated one. And that's why I'm not concerned about this kind of controlling or that putting ideas. I mean, like the um, like a transcendent also, right? In in this movie. In the movies, yeah. you get dreams implanted and stuff like that. In high resolution, Dolby stuff. What the hell? Nobody knows really how that should work. You need to get access to all your neurons right away at the same time. And you need to know exactly what to say, which neuron, in order for this neuron to interpret it in something which is useful and interpretable and relatable to you. That's so far away. That's nothing I would be afraid of right now. What is what is an issue is that that you can put by a really relatively crude stimulation, put people in a certain emotional state. Okay, So that is something which happens with deep brain stimulation. If the people having a deep brain stimulation um, and they were, they get, they get rid or at least they get ameliorated their Parkinson's symptoms, they might, because of the place you need to implant that thing, they might lose control they might kind of start getting a gambling habit or, or something mm -hmm. else there are stories about this that people really get out of control they have um, um for different for different reasons but this is very unspecific this is not that somebody could tell you now you need to kill these people 
by in, by stimulating your brain the right point. You 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 could make somebody probably in the next 20 years you could make somebody hate somebody else. That mm -hmm. is interesting. interesting. But again, it would not mean that you because you hate somebody you would right right away go kill him. Or you could make somebody uh, well, not sure love is very complicated. Hate is a lot easier. Yes. yes. You could I love agree. somebody but that doesn't mean that you would just hug him on the street right away if you don't even know that guy, right? There's a lot of different levels in, at play, and this is one of the issues which is the most important in the whole of neuroscience. We, we are talking, we have, we have a literal problem across scales. So we have the whole brain scale, which you can mm -hmm. access by MRI scanning, fMRI, for example, you see a lot, you use EEG, but then we need to go down to the single neurons, and perhaps you need to get all single neurons at the same time in order to understand a thought. And that's something which I'm not concerned about at all. And uh, I guess that uh, there is uh, no mathematical methods that uh, could uh, um, reveal reveal uh, at the level of uh, recordings, like uh, the, the feel of love, the feel of hate, or actually they exist. I I don't see on well, I would not see any reason why a recording of somebody, and if I'm recording from my rats. Whether or not they love another one, I would not see the difference. Okay. I would not see the difference. Main reason is that for all that, for, for, for very high complicated emotions, which I don't know whether a rat has this emotion actually, but for high mm -hmm. complicated emotions, you would need access to so many different places in the brain because they are acting together in order to feel some very complex um, uh, mm -hmm. say, behavior. Um, I would not. I would. I'd strongly doubt that I would see that in in any of those animals or even in humans. If I would record single cells, I wouldn't see the difference. Thank you. Also, I uh, read this in some publications where uh, researchers uh, worked with mice. Uh, they also applied deep brain stimul stimulations, and uh, they claimed that they uh, can control. Um, mice at uh, the decision making level is it possible yeah that is easy it is easy okay if you have a, if you have a left or right i mean that is known for a couple of years people did that kind of remote control of animals over a over, over a maze or so i mean think about it the animal has it's, it's it's in so far very easy because the animals for example they feel with their whiskers right so they have mm -hmm. the face yeah. whiskers and now this whiskers are projecting to the sensory areas in the brain. Now, if you are on purpose, very, very softly actually stimulating one side at the time when there is a decision to be made and the animal feels that as unpleasant, it will turn the other direction. Mm -hmm. right? So you are, you are influencing the decision-making by influencing selectively left or right. There are other places you can do that, but that is nothing I would say that you are really influencing its decision-making You're just influencing the senses and you're infer influencing the, the pathways it is using anyways. You can modulate them perhaps slightly. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. So we talked about brain implants, but uh, do people uh, use uh, some uh, implants uh, for peripheral nervous system, for example? Yes, in research. There is nothing in the clinic. This is one of the issues, by the way. Most of the stuff we are talking about here, except the brain stimulation, um, everything of that is, is still in research. Nothing is really solid in the clinic. And in the, and there is there is peripheral nerves and the peripheral nerve stimulation and recording. Um, a couple of years ago, somebody, well, one of the people here, actually Stieglitz and his group, and actually a group from ETH, mm -hmm. they they implanted um, an electrode array across a, the onion nerve of, a, of an amputee. And they were recording signals which were sent down, used that for controlling an uh, artificial hand, almost like Luke Skywalker. Yeah. And they did the same path on the way up. Um, to my knowledge, there are not more than five people in the world who ever had any useful implant on the peripheral nerve that way. Um, But, uh, I, I may be wrong. I may not hear that. But the point is that it's a it's it's a complicated implant. It's a complicated um, surgery, um, and it is it is risky because 
in this case, we are in the exper experimental phase of new materials and of, of materials which are useful for the future. But right now, there is not a lot accepted for human use for a longer period of time. And if you think about human use, you always have to think of how old do we are we becoming, right? So people are becoming 80 easily. So if you are if you are implanting something to a 30 old year old patient, you have to expect that the thing is gonna last for the next 50 years. And I'm not aware of any technology that could promise that right now easily. Not at all, actually. Yeah, very interesting. Thank you. I also read uh, in a recent uh, publication in Nature that there is one group, uh, they have actually a big collaboration. Um, they constructed implant to control bladder. Okay. So how is it realistic? Because well, I think this, is, uh, this is a very common problem in aging and after yeah, some... That is, yeah, that, that, is actually very, that is actually something which is in the clinical use in a way. Um, because they, it depends on how you define bladder control. Um, the mm -hmm. most, the, the the most important problem for for many paraplegic is actually mictation. When to start relieving yourself on command? Mm -hmm. That can be that can be done by stimulating stimulating one of the peripheral nerves in the in the lower in the lower body. However, this is a little touchy because these nerves are highly intermingled and they have more effects than just start miction right now. And that is um, that is something which is not easy to achieve by electrical pulses, which are very precisely timed, which are blocked at another time. And so that's things like that are happening. There are not so many people who have such an implant as well. Um, mm -hmm. I don't I don't know the exact numbers, but I think it's not not bigger than in the in the range of a couple of thousand. What is what is currently the most used and you can call it a peripheral nerve stimulation in a way the most used and most implanted um uh, new prosthesis is actually the cochlear implant mm -hmm. so you have the you are you you have people who are who are deaf but still have a cochlea and still have a an auditory nerve and then you are stimulating the auditory nerve cells extending into the cochlea electrically and present them some hearing information and um, which they can, per, or perception, which they can learn to interpret as speech, as sound, not quite the full range of symphonic music, but at least in a, in a wide range for speech, it's sufficient. And, um, and you are stimulating the auditory nerve. Unfortunately, auditory nerve is not counted as a peripheral nerve because it's a, it's a facial nerve, but that's a different story. <laughs> Thank you very much. I also saw some uh, patients and some companies that work with uh, retina stimulation. So patients uh, have uh, implants and they wear something like big glasses. And uh, in uh, the most successful cases, patients could uh, distinguish different uh, geometrical patterns. And uh, I think this is a great achievement because uh, people couldn't see anything and then suddenly they can at least uh, see a path, uh, see a table, black and white, but still. Yeah, there, there, but there, there is one thing to notice, actually. There, there used to be two companies out there. I mean, the, the point is, you only bring something to a patient if you go through a company. Whatever we do in research in our labs here, Mm -hmm. There's no value for any patient out there if it does not get, go through the whole approval and the whole safety issues and everything. So there is really there needs to be something behind the whole thing in order to push that into a patient. Now that needs money, and of course they get reimbursed if they are surviving long enough. And it's, that's exactly what happened to the to the most successful technologically most successful retina implant companies out there. They went belly up. They did not get the money back they needed and they went belly up. And now you have in one case, something like 300 people with a retina implant, which giving them a rudimentary, say brightness information, not really details, but brightness information. And the other one was a lot, a lot fewer, something like 50 or so. And, uh, and they, the, these implants now are in patients and they don't have technical support anymore because the companies are gone. So what to do with these patients? That's something which I think is a really big concern. I mean, because company, the way 
the way the economy works and the way the risk taking in the economy works is that you have something like a startup company who is taking the risk. You have somebody who is putting the money into the startup because he thinks he might get money out of it, kind of growing mm -hmm. a lot of money. And then there are milestones and things to happen. And if those things don't happen, then the investor says that, okay, I pulled the plug. I don't give you any more money. And then the, the company who is already halfway down the pathway to a commercialization mm -hmm. has a couple of volunteers who have the implants, who have the device, who use the device. Mm -hmm. they are, but there is no funding for them anymore to get the implant removed. And on the other side, there is nobody taking care of the implant anymore, at least not officially. And how often um, should the uh, implants be removed? Like, for example, they should not, they in the case of retina. should not be removed at all if there is nothing wrong with them. <laughs> nice. But still, uh, people have uh, allographic reactions. Yeah, right. If they have this reaction on it, then you need to remove them right away. If that's too strong, you have to you, you cannot leave them inside. I mean, what is what happens with the with the um, retina implant? Different companies um, they they are healthcare providers who pay for the removal of this non-functional implant now, but mm -hmm. uh, that's not feasible for everybody. Um, you know how the system in the US is; it's a little different in funding for healthcare. In Europe, it's easy actually. So um, just on. You remove them on purpose. If it's working, you don't do that. You do it, you remove it if it's not working anymore, if something is broken, or if there is some other whatever inflammation or anything you need to remove for medical reasons. Otherwise, mm -hmm. you leave it there. But unfortunately, with the eye and the retina implants are usually behind the retina with a little, I mean, you, you do a cut from the side of the eye and push the flexible electrodes behind the retina or on the retina. Um, It's a bad place to have an implant because your eye, even for blind people, the eye is moving all the time. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So that, is, that is something which needs to be considered for each patient out there. And uh, and I really feel for them. But it's not new. That's something which happened in the end of the 1990s, actually. There was a company which called Freehand. Not many people know that anymore. See, I'm, I'm so long in the field now. There's a mm -hmm. company named Freehand, and they were implanting electrodes for paraplegics, high paraplegics. They had electrodes under the skin, so there was no inflammation issue, to the muscle on the arm, on, the, on both arms. And then the stimulation would, would give those, a electrical stimulation would give those patients a certain type of freedom. They could, they could lift their arms, they could even grab something. There is even people who use that freehand system to, to control it with the BCI, with the brain-computer interface. Mm -hmm. So a lot of things going on. And then freehand went belly up because they didn't get the money back and the investors just jumped. And now you had a couple of dozens, I'm not sure how many, but freehand was very popular this time. You had a couple of dozen at least patients out there with an implant under their skin, which had no further use and they had nobody to support that, at least not in general. Yes. What to do with this patient? So this is not a new situation. We had it several times. And nothing happened till, till now. I'm a little concerned about that. I, I personally would require the authorities like the FDA or so, I would require them to, so you have the money for, for producing the implants, then you need to put the money into a, into a insurance, which is paying if you go belly up and it's removing it again. But that's not part of the game yet. Thank you for sharing this because yes, man, mainly people uh, discuss uh, mechanism principles uh, of these implants or multi arrays, but uh, uh, not uh, so many people uh, think about uh, how to man maintain these implants in patients. Yes, yes. practicalities are an issue, and they are really, and that's what I, I said in the very beginning. If you think about, if you recall what I said about the bed of nails implants mm -hmm. in, in patients, the black rock mm -hmm. or the human arrays. Uh, The first implants in humans were something like 2004, maybe three, I'm not sure about it, roughly mm -hmm. four. It was published 2006. Since then, we have now 2023. Since then, we have something like 30 implants. And it's still considered extremely experimental. And it's still collecting information in order to get it into a state that it can be used on a wider range, on a clinical range. 20 years of data collection on that issue, I think... I'm not expecting to have anything close to approval for any of these devices for human use cortical implants within the next 10 to 15 years. You may see experimental issues, but you don't see, I, I, I don't expect to see any really true clinical use, which is useful for the patient in the next decade or so. 
So what we can say about brain implants? They are risky, they are difficult to maintain, but still uh, this is very promising devices. And especially I agree with it if we talk about uh, some chronic diseases, but um, could you please tell when people use uh, deep brain stimulation uh, if they have uh, depression? Yeah, that is a relatively new um, development. There are, I'm aware of two different schools, kind of. It depends on where do you implant. So the stimulation is always the same, essentially, right? It's the electrode, which I just which I explained, the silicon virus, silicon, ins silicon rubber insulated virus, four electrodes, 32 electrodes, different ones of them. And now the question is, where do you put them in order to have the, mo the maximum effect for treating a major depression mm -hmm. disorder. And there is a group in, or it's, it's a quite a, it's a school actually, in the US, which decided that this is, we put that in the area, don't nail me, area 20 something of the corte or of the brain. And we stimulate mm -hmm. there. And then the, the initial results were very promising. And then uh, Medtronic took over that project and they uh, were recruiting they were looking to recruit 200 volunteers who got the implant, but they had to stop after 100 volunteers the project because the implantation at that particular location was not sufficiently um, effective. Mm -hmm. So it did show effects in some patients, but not in general. Kind of hard to say because it's, an, it's a commercial decision to make, but that's the impression you gain from the outside if you talk to people and <laughs> read papers. Mm -hmm. There is another group, which interestingly is actually neighbors of us here in Freiburg. And they decided, we, we think that we need to implant it to a completely different place. And, and, and this is the so-called medium forebrain bundle. There are other people out there who do that too. The people here in the, with the implant to the medium forebrain bundle, um, I think they are now in a number of 150 or so. They have a mid, this mid-sized um, clinical study as well now. And it looks actually very promising. Most of the patients who have this implant at the proper place do show a beneficial effect. So that might be really something down the road, which is which is useful for for the patients, particularly for uh, patients with untreatable major depression disorder, because that is a that's a bummer. If you have that, it's, it's really nothing I, I would like to share to anybody. And. Um, it really depends. So everything, all of those strategies, whatever you want to treat, all of those strategies depend on where do you find an access point to attack it. But, yes. Right. And so, if we are talking about the same pathologies, still the targets uh, could be different. Yes. And of course, just very practical, practical. The targets are different for different patients, right? I mean, mm -hmm. it's anatomically the same region, but it's not at the same spot from patient to patient. So you need a you need somebody, you need a neurosurgeon who is really able to kind of cope with that situation too. It's not an easy, it's not an easy medication, it's not an easy pharmaceutical solution for something like you you throw a pill and in 99% of the patients it works somehow, somehow, mm -hmm. somewhere at some time. Not necessarily with depression, but with most of the other stuff. But when it comes to electroceuticals, to implants into, into the brain, to electrical stimulation, modern world is bioelectronic medicine. If it comes to that, it is still more art than, than industry. Speaking about patients with depression, is it possible to, for example, in the situation when uh, researchers uh, found the place uh, for perfect stimulation in a patient, is it possible that uh, this patient with depression um, has the stimulation for some time and then uh, he or she uh, have these uh, explanting of this device yeah and uh, and became healthy again is it possible that this is not permanent stimulation that this is uh, well, I cannot I I can't comment on that it's imaginable but it's easy to be tested because you just turn off your stimulator, you have it sitting in the right spot, mm -hmm. you turn it off, you see how you feel, how it works, 
whether you still need it or not. And if you find out that, yes, I still feel depressed, then you turn it on again. So it's it's easy to test, technically. Mm -hmm. you know? So, But I guess nobody yet uh, discovered, is it possible to use the brain stimulation to treat, to totally treat uh, the major depression? No. I mean, this is what all those... Deep brain, deep brain stimulation, electroceutical things are doing are actually, we are only treating symptoms. Okay. We do not treat the disease, never. Not in Parkinson's, not in OCD, not in depression, not in whatever. We are only treating symptoms. Very important to notice. Okay, thank you very much. Yes, uh, many people speculate about Neuralink. Uh, could you please, uh, as a professional in uh, neurotechnologies, Uh, give us some comments, what is new, what is not new? So Neuralink is actually very heroically are uh, producing something on an industrial scale, which anybody else in the field only did as proof of principle. Mm -hmm. So the implants of flexible probes was done in 2001 by a complete other group on a laboratory scale. Neuralink now scales everything up into an industrial scale in order mm -hmm. to to have a lot more of that in order to have it easier so it's a it's it's not new in a way but it's a step in the right direction when it comes to patient use right mm -hmm. patient directions so i'm very impressed of that it's um, they thankfully do not claim to be new they always not always but they most of the time say that yes somebody else did that already and somebody else did that but hey we do it better fine with me i'm completely fine with that <laughs> um, it's the same with this, with the with the uh, spaceship with the Starlink um, satellites. Other people did satellites with the with the rockets. Other people did rockets. We do it now a little. We do it cheaper. We do it better. Fine with me. That's completely okay. I'm, I'm absolutely fine with that. What I'm not fine with, what I'm really not fine with, is the statement I hear from Neuralink, particularly Elon Musk. Very often, or not very often, he says that, and he thinks that this is really the way to go. It will be as easy as implanting is like a LASIK eye surgery. Uh-huh. And yes, it will be, surgery. Yes. And it will be used for and it will be used for us to hook up to connect our minds to the artificial intelligence, which is will be our overlord, whatever. So there is so much wrong in this in this statement, which he's coming up with, and so so many dangerous things in these statements that I'm really a little disappointed that he can still, he still collects money for his company. Um, so in a way, he's a salesperson just trying to get money from venture capitals. Yes, it's like uh, the rise in your ca capital of your company. Yes, exactly. Because AI is a very popular topic. Implants, yes. brain. It's a, I mean, he has, I don't know why he does that. The point is, from a, from the, <clears throat> from a clinical, say, commercial point of view, I have no clue what he wants to treat, which which disease he wants to tackle. That's why I asked you in the beginning. You asked me, well, yeah. different pathologies need a different need uh, one implant, and I say, what pathology do you want to tackle? And in his case, it's the same thing. The stuff he's doing right now is technologically super cool, but what pathology can you treat by implanting something in the cortex? And that's his goal. He can only implant into the cortex, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. So, what is the pathology he wants to tackle? What is the market behind it? How many does he need to implant every year in order to get his money back for the for the investment he's doing? I'm not an invest, investment person, so I really it's not my point. It's I don't mm -hmm. earn money in that game. But if I would invest into a company, like I would ask, so where is the money coming from after you have your wonderful solutions and your first FDA approved implant? Which, by the way. Thankfully, FDA at this time did not approve his first in man trials uh, because they did not completely fulfill their their um, requirements yet. I don't know whether he heard about that. Mm -hmm. He was claiming that by the end of the year, he has the first implant in a human. And FDA said, ah, not so fast. We are missing information. Good point. Thank you. And also, I have some concerns about uh, this uh, uh, manipulation with the uh, um, 
uh, the highest levels of your co- in your in your cortex uh, because uh, like their dream their goal is to uh, make this uh, brain computer device uh, to create a, Give me a second. I, need, I, need to, I need to put you on hold for a minute here because somebody needs seems to break into my room here right now <laughs> okay okay <laughs> Always busy, Ulrich. Yes. <laughs> nice. Yeah. So yeah, okay. my question is um, that these people want to create these brain computer interfaces to boost up uh, learning uh, capabilities of humans to enhance probably some memory uh, capacities but mike and and to help them communicate with the world without our typical ways of communication for example without speech without uh, some movements and uh, i'm a bit afraid of this because uh, these uh, actions that we are normally use speech and movements yeah. this is things that are naturally uh, ma- maintain our brain activity and brain functions and if we will use implants as uh, as toys i guess humanity uh, will uh, lose it actually not well, not will boost it boost it but will lose it i'm not too much afraid of that um i think the I think the example of the of Google Maps on the cell phone is a bad one because if you have nowadays nobody tries to orient himself around anymore because hey I have Google Maps I don't need to know where I am um but that doesn't work with the that does not work in the brain with the brain activity and the stuff behind the brain activity if you have a if you have a medical reason a serious medical not for a toy but a serious medical reason in order to get some information channel out there. Like, I mean, there is there is really cool work recently from San Francisco group. They have an implant. They even have an EG system. They record from the brain and they transfer that into, into written signs, so literally handwriting, or they transfer that into, into speech, into language. Mm-hmm. That is something which might be extremely useful for the patient who is not able to talk and to communicate properly. Mm-hmm. And he will use that channel in a way which is not foreseeable for us right now. He will start with somebody who has an implant then or who has the proper BCI system then for the speech recognition stuff. This will be used. And I strongly doubt that he will lose speech inform- speech uh, capabilities because otherwise he would have lost the speech ca- capabilities the time he was muted by whatever disease. Mm-hmm. Get my point? So that what they do is right now there are patients out there who have who lost the capability to control their vocal cords and their vocal um, structure, but they still think of speaking, right? They did not use it, and they still think, and the signal is still there. Why should it go if you are using now the signal to do something different with it or to use it on an electronic device to put it out? I don't see that as a as a serious concern. Okay, thank you. So if we use uh, implants in correct place and for correct purpose for patience <laughs> yes we have a, we have a hope <laughs> for better life <laughs> I, do, I, do. And, and I really have i mean it's it's uh, I, I still hope that we will with our research here we will find a way of avoiding all this oncology problem which might appear um over time um and so i really have hoped in doing that otherwise uh, uh the implants will be used for people on a very careful way for really patients who need that. If there is a need for it, it's a good idea in order to continue research on that direction. Thank you, Uli. It was a pleasure for me to have a talk with you. Time is flying. So to conclude, could you please describe uh, your work in three words? (laughs) Do not implant. (laughs) <laughs> surprising <laughs> <Honest>. <laughs> brief <laughs> and genius <laughs>